Welcome to APEC. Hey guys, yeah, it's a bit bit later. <laughs> I think we're at what for nearly five in the morning. Oh wow! Thanks for staying up so late. Yeah, I know it's all I'm used to it because a lot of our team members are now in the US. Hey, uh, any any chance that uh, you know for perhaps later, since you haven't got the links up and running right now, we could you know send email back and forth so we can take a look at some of that information and try to replicate. Yeah, that's uh, the way for you to get that over. Does my camera come on for everybody or just? I think we can all see it. Yeah, we can right. all. See it. Yeah, but I don't know why it's done this, but I mean, as soon as I went off the screen to find the... Uh... There's the real possibility that your computer is compromised or your software is uh, is hacked or malfunctioning. That's something we've seen a lot in this field. I know, we've, we've got that pretty well covered. It's just something I've done stupid. We, <laughs> we've, we've been up against the NSA and everyone. Oh, rather. So... Uh, I've had major connections uh, this whole this whole conference, but it's probably just my uh, RAM running out. <laughs> Matt, I sent you the picture of uh, magnets. Is that something that you can you can share with the rest of the group on the private chat? I think when I was trying to send it, because uh, you was talking, I clicked on you. <laughs> so that was Mark you're talking to there. Mark, you sent Mark some pictures. Oh, I think he sent to you. Because uh, I, I haven't got any pictures at all from, from you so far, unfortunately. I'm looking in the chat here, and it's just not showing anything like that. In the chat group, just oh, right, um, there's a drop down. Right, yeah. You click everyone. Right, I I mean, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's showing that already. This might work now. I've just... Yeah, it's showing the whole chat here, and I, I haven't gotten anything from him yet. Right, so... Right, no, that didn't go to the whole group, did it? Uh, we got it to me privately. Right, okay, so that. Okay, so I need to change it to whole group. Let me Everyone, uh, right, I got it, right, I should be able to do yeah. it again now. I'm going to download it if and try to send it to everyone if it doesn't work. Oh, yeah, you got it. Send it to everyone now. Yeah. Okay, there it is. There is a file. Excellent. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, this is an old, old picture, 2008. The idea of but, modifying, you know, modifying the, the different frames between the two sides of this cylinder, to me, is a phenomenal idea. And however it's being done harmonically or, or what, I mean, that's a pretty phenomenal claim and definitely something that we should be looking into. And if we had known about it earlier, would have been. Well, it's all, the thing is, everything that you're doing with the microwaves and the magnetics, it's all correct. It's just that, because we, we, we did all that, and it's like you're absolutely spot on with it. But what we realised, and it's like there may be two different effects with gravity, I don't know, but what we realised was we looked at, we looked at them uh, as we started to look at it as an audible signal and to convert it into an audible signal so we can put a combination of several signals together to create that gravity effect. But on, on that picture, it shows that, like, we well, the only way we figured we could demonstrate what was going on with the magnets was to basically put them under some paper and sprinkle iron filings over it because you can't fake that. So it shows on the left, it shows a normal magnetic field. And then on the right, it shows the, the, <coughs> the two south poles with the north poles in the middle. And then it's like, they've been nice with a bigger sheet of paper early, but you can see like, there's, if you imagine this in 3D, it I'm almost shows. So if you imagine that in 3D, it, it shows you've got a disc that emanates out from the, the sensor from the Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's almost like, um, yeah, it's like, the, it's like the, uh, the magnetic fields are the accretion disc of a black hole and, the, you know, the, the rotation. Yeah, or, the bi or the bipolar, you know, yeah. like a pulsar. 
I've got two uh, N48 uh, neodyniums, uh, 22 millimeters diameter here on uh, five millimeters thick, and I press two of them together, but at, at no point, no matter how well they're aligned with north to north or south to south, uh, they don't seem to have any moment at which their repulsion weakens or there is any point of attraction. So how do we achieve that? You, you've got to reprogram them. And, uh... I mean, how do you actually, I, I, I understand the heating and the, the, the inflow current to reprogram them, but what, what ways, what patterns do you reprogram them with, I guess would be the good question. What I'll do when, when we're all next on, because a lot of what I do have is all on my hard drive, so don't keep it on the laptop. Ah, uh, smart, uh, very smart, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, now, I, I promise you, you won't believe the trouble we've had. Uh, I will uh, believe you, because we've had quite a bit ourselves. I really do believe you. <laughs> over the years. Uh, oh, yeah, you name it, I've probably seen worse. It's like we've even got police records, we've been kidnapped, been held under house arrest by the Syrians, been shot at. I've had two laboratories shut down, been accused of all sorts of manner of things. We know. They're, they're, they're even getting involved in my divorce. It's like, it's insane. And the, they were outside the shop over here hitting us with radiation. And I felt it. That's why I have so many Geiger counters and uh, <clears throat> the email shit. Oh my God. It's just like nonstop. They're threatening everyone. But at the end of the day, they're not coming to my face and saying, you're going to get hurt by this. And I'm seeing a lot of like, just, support you know things are appearing that i need wayne found that piece of equipment just lying on the side of the street that he needed and there's a lot of there's a lot of good going on as well but um the bad has definitely happened and i think there was a turning point this is getting into a little bit of a conspiracy theory but um i don't know if you're familiar with the uh a tip uh, article from the new york times on, on december 16th 2017 when the New York Times, which is a very conservative newspaper, posted that uh, the Pentagon's been investigating UF uh, flying saucers and yada, yada, yada. And, it, you know, it's a real phenomenon. It was started by Harry Reid with $22 million. And uh, the head of that program, which is Lou Elizondo, which, uh, who was actually invited to this chat, um, uh, he got on uh, national news and said, yeah, those things are real and they're extraterrestrial. So I think after that period the uh, mentality of who, of the secret keepers has changed and there's been a lot less you know open uh, attacks against people uh, you could tell me uh, robert you could tell me if that's true but has anything happened to you guys since 2018 uh right we're we're really good friends with tracy reidner Mm -hmm. uh, you know from the movie Apollo 13, Tom Hanks, Tracy, right? We're good friends with them. Now, Tracy Ridenev, the whole of Tracy Ridenev's family is Lawrence Livermore Labs. All right. And also, you know, the uh, Montauk Project, the Jump Room. Um, no, I'm not familiar with them, but, but did they have any experience after... Uh, um after 27 after uh, 2018 after that event well let's just say that tracy reidner's family of the people behind all that why we get the hassle <laughs> okay <laughs> let's just say that if you look up tracy reidner apollo 13 uh she was like uh, tom hanks's wife in the movie but if you look them up basically uh her family's lawrence livermore and they're involved in, in a lot of stuff. But I, I can absolutely believe that we... I've, I've, yeah, I've got memories of being subject to what may have been some sort of energy attack weapons in the past, where it's impossible to sleep and irritable and... But to be honest with you, the last 35 years have just been crazy anyway. It's, it's been really interesting. Okay, so I'm, I just made up the iron powder. I actually have two very large neodymium magnets that are uh, pushed together in opposition, which is, I'm assuming, what you had in that experiment, in that uh, picture that you sent. Well, he was saying that they were reprogrammed magnets specifically. That's what we were just talking yeah, about. but not, but right. not magnets. Yeah, I'll show you what regular magnets look like so we can just uh, compare. 
Yeah. Yeah, what what we need to do is need to one of the days I'll I'll actually try and work out a way of demonstrating this on video where you can see where I can put the magnet down and push another magnet towards it so you can see it push the other one yeah, away. Easy way to do and that, then, too, Tachyon. A uh, super easy way. All you got to do is take a neodymium magnet, stick a fairly thick steel washer on the end of it, or for that matter, any ferromagnetic material on the end of it. And in its far field, it'll repel another, you know, like pull. But if you get it close enough, they'll mutually attract the iron and, and repolarize that since it has a saturation point higher enough, high, high enough to, uh, you know, hold both fields. So there is another way to do that. I wonder what the field symmetry would be compared to two south poles or two north poles stuck against a washer where there's this mutual interaction within that material itself versus the reprogramming of the magnets themselves. What do you think? Yeah, that might be a good way to try it. Because I have Just a feeling that as far as the pattern looks on the iron filings, it would generate a very similar pattern. It doesn't mean that magnets would work the same way or work with your machine, but I, I do believe the pattern would look the same on the filings. Yeah, but... What what you need to do, you need to take the iron filings off the paper, put your magnet underneath the big sheet of paper, and then sprinkle the iron filings down. Exactly. With your... I was just wondering what, what kind of sprinkling device I have. Maybe like a... Uh, a your salt fingertips, paper. Mark. Your, your fingers. fingers. <laughs> your fingers. Just... I don't like this. No, put it in a pepper shaker, then. I'll, I'll put it in a pepper shaker. Just give me a second. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's funny i think that's funny uh i i thought about that too there's a old, there's a steinmetz reference about actually taking a very strong uh changing magnetic field and uh dropping onto it some dielectric ground mica powder because in the time of steinmetz you know mica was the the leading insulator fantastic but pitiful by the today's standards dielectric material and if you sprinkle the sprinkle these filings onto this changing magnetic field because it's dielectric um, it will be moved around by the field and form concentric rings around the field poles instead of lines between them. And I think, I, I thought that was a really, really interesting experiment. I have yet to replicate it, but uh, just the idea that it's in that book, you know, it's, a, it's an old published book. I think it'll be really cool to demonstrate that since I haven't seen it done yet. I'll tell you what, it'd be nice to actually see this magnetic field uh, with feathers fluid. That would be cool too. Uh, I remember... Uh, Geez, I can't remember this guy's name. I think his first name was David. He talks about uh, he talks about a series of different magnetic configurations, mainly like curved magnets or uh, banana-shaped magnets. Just the term banana-shaped magnet should probably find his name. But uh, regardless of, of who he is, he talks about this device that you know would scan and, and map a magnetic field and map all of its poles and where they were, and you know show that you in a uh, three-dimensional computer graph, sort of sort of if you were to use like a slice away. CNC where we just cut layers and take pictures. This device sort of did that profiling with the magnetic field and would scan through it. And he found some interesting geometries uh, with these opposing poles as well, which, which leads me back into what you may have discovered. Well, what, one of the things we tried, do you remember when uh, we come out with the Halibut array? You know, the magnetic Halibut array where we configure a series of magnets in the, in the disk. The Hallback array is a really fantastic yeah. way to project the field. Uh, with a very high intensity at the surface, but what it gains in intensity at that point, it loses in uh, range. And unfortunately, even the Hallback array suffers from a problem where in terms of the magnetic material used, you don't actually get the entire field of all that material. You get a percentage of it, but it's it's much stronger at that concentration point. Well, well what we try to do, we because the back of that array doesn't have any energy, essentially, it's just like... Right, it's supposed to be And we, we tried building a couple of them and putting them together similar to our magnetic assembly to see if we could get the same effects, but it doesn't give the same effect because it doesn't generate the disc through the middle. Ah, okay. Because if you look at that photo, you'll see like the normal magnetic field where the, the field sweeps round in the lines. And then you, you look at the south-south one, you can see the two norths in the middle and the south and south. And then you you can see the, the way the field comes out and back in. Yeah, I do. Back. I do see the. Uh, it's like two little toroidal fields, sort of, and you have this barrier, like ring, you know, almost like a ring around it that you can see this concentration zone. 
Yeah, and then it, it's like, I wish I'd have had more filings on it, really, but it, it's one of them things when you innovate and you, you've, like, solved what you were trying to do, you don't sort of bother with it anymore. You just sort of know, right, that's what we're going to work with now. But we, we do still have all the, all the paperwork and all the information, so be able to share that for you to have a look and maybe you could improve on it or yeah and if like, you do we can replicate different. it we can share it with you and show you what we did and maybe that will give you validity you can say well this independent laboratory also did it and this is what they found and it agrees with these results so i mean we could help each other out definitely and we would learn something along the way which is honestly the most important part to us because we're yeah. just trying to understand how this all works yeah no, that's, that's what it comes down to but if you imagine, if you look at that picture with the south-south and then you imagine a coil around the the middle of that and then you, res you, you play a frequency into that coil, what it does, it destabilizes the magnetic coupling. And when it does that, the pole starts to flip really fast. And as they flip, you've now got a pole flipping from north-south, north-south in the middle inside uh, a coil which then induces uh, an electrical charge in the coil like moving magnetic field in a coil so it induces a charge in the coil and then what happens is it, it creates uh, almost like a feedback resonance and then it's the actual jets that like we don't bother with the discs coming out around the middle because when you've put the coil on there, that's pretty much shielded. What we focus on is the, the jet coming out the top and bottom. So then we then position that jet towards the uh, the piece of material. So say like you was like going to manipulate that glasses case, you would have the jet set. So they're positioned several of them around this case, and then when you're playing the different harmonics into that field, into the coils, and then there's an outer phase harmonic that gets played back into the electrical charge in the coil, that's, or the frequency of the charge that's being fed in, that changes the whole sort of dynamics of the, the frequency, so the jets then resonate that frequency, so they then focus that into the material, so then this material becomes a combination of several, several like different harmonics. So then the question is, uh, are these coils independently driven with each one frequency and it's the frequencies of all the independent resonators that combine in the material or is each coil literally driven with seven different frequencies? Seven different frequencies. I'm each guessing, coil... so the coil only has two input wires. That means that basically these seven frequency generators, they're somehow combined or you know, there, there's some way that you interface all seven frequencies so that you can just feed two wires with an amplifier. Is that correct? Yeah, we basically, we have like an input, positive, negative input, straight in. This is going to be fun. Oh, that's, that's looking pretty cool. Can you guys see you it? Might have to do, you might have to do it from higher up, though. Um, let me try to get the... I think the problem, got is, some the problem is that my shirt is uh, black, so you can't see it. Uh, Just you've got some pretty hefty uh, magnets there. <laughs> oh, these are these are very hefty magnets. Okay, so there we go. That's a great setup. Try that yeah, so we have the input. So, so you've got several frequency generators that are generating the frequencies, and they're all fed then. Uh, amplified and fed into the, a single coil around each array of like two magnets and then when we resonate them magnets it allows them to separate and connect and then because what's happening is the poles are flipping like the electrons flip in their orientation in the magnetic field so we resonate and as they resonate and you end up with a moving magnetic field but in, a, in sort of a solid state form inside the coil. And that induces a, ch a charge like in the coil, an electrical charge in the coil, which then changes the harmonics of the frequency that's going in. And that harmonics comes out as a magnetic resonance in the beam. 
Can you guys tell us? Wow, it's it's a really complicated uh, it's really complicated thing I understand to explain and <clears throat> hopefully not too complicated to do, but you know no, it's not complicated to do. It's like pretty much what you've just done there, but you're having to bolt the magnets together. It's like imagine that you can just push them together where if you don't want to go and then all of a sudden they stick because what's important is that they're allowed to come undone and stick again. And what's interesting, the more that you separate them and put them back together, the easier it gets. And after about 10 or 15 times, it's like there's no magnetic field there at all. There's nothing. The magnets have like gone dead. It's really strange. And then you turn the magnet round, turn one of them round, and put the north to the south, whichever way or south to the north, and be stick, separate it again, turn it round. We don't want to stick again. Hey, uh, Mark, would you, if you if you separate those, you drop the filings on, what we're looking for is this this idea of a disc showing up in the center, where instead of the filings just sort of being around one pole and the other, is this, there's this seeming line between the two poles that sort of collects. Uh, did you see that? Um, what I saw was there was this strange area. There's like this um, blink spot in this around the uh, around the magnets, and out there there is some sort of field out here. But it's very strange that there's this no go zone for the uh, for the iron filings. But I was not seeing a line shooting out like he showed earlier. The poles may be a little too far away as well. I mean, still, they, they may actually have to be, you know, physically pressed up against each other and touching, perhaps. Uh, do they have to be? The two magnets, you want the two magnets. So, we, yep, you're sort of doing it with brute force, where we, we've done it where we've reprogrammed to the stick. You're, you're literally bolting the two north or the two souths and forcing them together, but you want them touching. Oh, okay. I could I could tighten it up and uh, and actually get them touching. By the way, the um, the material this is an aluminum rod with uh, brass uh, bolts, so it's non uh, ferromagnetic materials. So yeah, but when you compress the magnetic field like that, you may be getting <clears throat> some sort of diamagnetics going on in the aluminum. Uh, it's possible. But nothing that I wouldn't think it's going to hurt with what you're trying to do on the display. Right, and you just got to find what you can use. Oh, we've been but it should be okay. I'd just, I'd just tighten them up so they're touching and then put your own filings on a piece of paper and sprinkle them from high up and just let them like rain down on it. Yeah, that, that's what I did over here with the glass. Um, I could try it with okay. a piece of paper. It'd probably give you better... Uh, res um, Better, uh, you know, viewing capabilities. One sec. Try that again. Uh, so you're saying sticking the two magnets together tighter would make a different effect? Yeah, if you put, because it's like the way, the way ours are working, though, it's like the, the programmed to do that, where if you don't want to stick and then we suddenly stick. What, what you're doing there is literally physically trying to force two south or two north poles together. You're literally forcing them together. Yeah, that's what this is. All right. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see the effect you get. But maybe if you put the magnet on the table, put the piece of glass over the magnet, then put your paper on top, your white paper, and then sprinkle the filings down from about two foot away and just let uh, them fall I down. Use, I wouldn't use glass. The glass uh, felt like it was about to break. I'd probably use uh, uh, I w some other material. Just you could you can always just leave the, the piece of paper over the top because that's all we did. We just put this magnet is very very strong, and I don't want the iron filings getting stuck to it. Um, right, yeah, no, it can be fun. <laughs> uh, one second. I'll, I'll I'll find something that will work with. Uh, MDF. Yes, so that's a bit. Back to this, this apparatus and this setup. So there you go, that'll do it. But so uh, the other nice thing about this is, is you know, uh, imagine you was we've done this in the lab. You take a block of aluminium and you heat it up over a Bunsen burner, 
and you put a crystal based transducer on it and phase lock loop and what you can do is you can record the frequency of the heat so heat's just a frequency of movement of like molecules so what you do is you can record that frequency and then by using the bipolar field generators like this effect is demonstrating in the picture you can transmit the beam to a corresponding magnet array and then that corresponding magnet array is connected to the transducer back to a block of aluminium and the second block of aluminium will heat up on the same frequency but you can't transmit that signal of the frequency of the heat with a radio signal or with a normal electromagnetic field like radio signal, you have to transmit it on the beam that's generated by the, the magnetic field generator. So it allows you to literally heat one cube up uh, on one side of the lab and then aim the magnet across to the other corresponding magnets on the other side of the room. And that field then transmits along the beam the frequency and then the other magnet resonates at that frequency inside the coil. I thought I wanted to know what you were talking about before, but man, I really want the information on this experiment. We want to do this one. This is so fundamental. The idea of transmitting thermal energy from one location to another is such an incredible idea. And, and as far as something to test, if we could test it, we well, would we've done that. test it. We've we, we've done this and sort of proved it, tested it and published it in this publication, but uh, it was based around on our flight system, uh, like obviously on a, on a uh, single stage to orbit and beyond sort of craft, you need to be able to move heat around on the craft. So we've used this technique on our smart skin to move heat to other parts of the craft. Wow, I mean, uh, we've got to get more heat, info. But, <laughs> but it, it's what's interesting, we tried to, because what the thinking was, if, if you think of it in layman terms, if you've got a, a block, let's say, you've got a block of, of uh, aluminium and you heat this block up with a Bunsen burner, then that is a particular frequency for heat uh, generates uh, movement in other molecules or so that, that becomes a frequency. So what you do is you, you make a crystal transducer, quartz transducer, and you record the frequency of that heat. Now, if you try and transmit that on, say, an FM 20 watt transmitter, because we built some little uh, 20 watt FM transmitters that like, you can use on the radio and try to transmit that signal and then play that. But you can't, the frequency which is being generated when this block of aluminium has been heated up with the Bunsen burner, the FM transmitter can't tra transmit enough of an amplitude or transmit. Yeah, I was just about to but say, it's, it's an amplitude limitation, right? Because there's actual information, physical energy in terms of joules per centimeter that's being radiated from that thing in a radiated field. But to try to just create the same types of signal peaks without the same exact amplitude levels would, would be effectively just playing back, you know, a tape recording of a live band. It's a totally different thing. And it might be yeah. acoustically where you're sitting the same thing, but it's certainly not the entirety of the, of the acoustics that are going on there. But by playing that signal into the coil that sits around and am amplifying it and playing it into the coil that sits around the bipolar magnetic assembly, then both ends of that magnet are giving out a jet of say a north or south pole, which way you configure it, it doesn't not really relative, but it gives out a jet. So what you do is you you then have that picture that you see there of the two south poles with your coil. You aim the jet across the room to line it up with your, the corresponding other set of magnets. And what it does is it that then makes the other set of magnets resonate in the corresponding coil and then uh -huh. the coil that it produces an electrical uh, charge in the coil and then that electrical charge 
is unique to the uh, signal that has just come from the other magnet, and that's played. Uh, sorry, Ben, the, the jet of the magnet is aimed into the aluminium, yeah, the block, and it causes a resonance, and the other piece of aluminium heats up the same as the one that you've just transmitted from. That's fascinating. Now, you have a system of two coils and two blocks of aluminium. You, you input a signal into coil A. Do you also simultaneously input an amplified signal into coil B? And uh, No, that one doesn't need power. In the that coil one is a. passive, then. It receives the signal only. It doesn't have any yeah. power source. Yeah, the other one just receives the frequency because wow. the frequency is carried on the jet, on the beam, and then the other magnet starts to resonate inside the coil. So when it resonates in the coil, it produces an electrical... <clears throat> Uh, produces a, a voltage at a particular frequency in the coil and then that voltage then interacts with the oscillating magnetic field which creates a, a copy cat of the original signal. So, so then actually I have to ask uh, what's the range on this thing? Well, we only done it over about 40 feet so I don't know. Four, did you say 40 feet? Yeah that was all uh, because like that was how long the lab was. 40 feet is ridiculous. How big were these magnets? Uh, about 20, tw is it 25B, 12 mil, 25 mil B. I mean, that, okay, honestly, that, that's a tiny little neodymium magnet compared to what's available today. That thing is tiny, and you're talking about a distance, an effective field range for any signal transmitted, which is drastically orders of magnitude beyond any capability of electromagnetism as you were talking about it's not electromagnetic but i mean that 40 feet range on something that small would indicate yeah a, a totally different type of field that we don't even have a name for probably well it's just that the beam coming out it's the focus beam coming out of the magnet because when you've got your coil around the magnet what you do when you when you, oh, not what you do what's happening is the the connection between the two, which uh, like both north poles end up switching and becoming like like flip flopping, like say north south, so they end up resonating like this. So but without the field actually... poles wrapping up on each other, like they normally close right away, right? Boyd Bushman released a patent called the magnetic field beamer or magnetic beamer, yeah, just magnetic beamer, and it effectively was an array of uh, of at least three magnets, preferably uh, five or more magnets, where where all except for one magnet were arranged axially with all the poles pointing in towards the center of a shaft and all the poles pointing out straight away from the center, no physical thing in the center. And then on uh, one side of that space, the same distance as these other periphery axial magnets were from the center of their location was another magnet with its, with its light pole pointed towards it. And uh, a coil positioned around, directly around that last magnet, that single one in the center, was flipped around with high amplitudes, and this would break the field lines that couple between all the outside magnets and the center magnet and cause a beam to be produced, which Bushman himself claimed could extend the discharge length of a Van de Graaff generator or Tesla coil from being only a few, uh, from being only a centimeter to uh, several centimeters or several inches. And it had other strange phenomena, but it had the ability to beam the magnetic signal straight out the end of this thing as a result of disrupting the magnetic coupling between these different poles. And it sounds kind of like what you're talking about is very similar. It just yeah, well, if, you, if you look at if you look at this from the point of view where you've your magnets and you look at that field and then you've got uh, a DC coil around that in the middle and you're playing this frequency into the DC coil what happens is the, the magnet starts to separate and attach, but at a phenomenal rate, at like thousands and thousands of hertz. So they're, they're resonating. And then when, when they start to, the, the poles are flip-flopping, then you end up with moving poles inside the coil, which then generates another electric field in the coil. That's around um, it. So you've got a DC field now, which say let's just say it resonates at ten hertz, and then that then, then you then causing the magnets on the inside of the coil to flip flop, 
So you've now got the, the poles are, are flip-flopping at the junction. So, uh, Robert, let me interrupt for just a second. I noticed we have another guest, Monomorphic, down there. I, I want to ask if they would like to introduce themselves or if they have anything to add or anything like that. I, I just noticed that I just noticed they were down there. I've been wondering the same thing too. I, I didn't want to ask. I figured some people just want to kind of listen in, but you know, I, I, and I think know that though I would, it, it could, I think it might be Bill Alex. Um, I think it might be Bill Alex's wife or she might've left her because I, I think she came on. I think that person came on at the same time Bill Alec did. So I think she may have left her zoom just on and gone to bed, but <laughs> you know, at this That's time of the night, it, it would be would be difficult to blame. Yeah, we've been going for a while, but it's been a pretty interesting one, all in all. Just a general, I, I would say it's again a nice kind of more relaxed discussion. Yeah, well, and I think that's good, right? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody has any, you know. No, I mean, if we're on tonight, right? It's because it's because we have allocated the time to pursue the passions that you know things we care about on this topic because it's such a seldom pursued and such a seldom discussed thing. Just the idea of even having a human conversation with other people who give a darn about the implications of the technology for me is significant at least. And I would imagine that people who joined tonight probably had somewhat of a similar idea because a lot of people stuck around for a while, which is kind of neat because, you know, some of these are big names in here. But and some of them only yeah. left because their batteries died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, people can't stay on forever, but they, they stuck around for about as, as long as they could. And I think in general, just, there is there's that discussion that shows you're not alone in this topic. And generally speaking, we've been alone for a really long time. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, that's, that's one of the challenges. I've mentioned this to Mark earlier in chat that the problem is everybody, everybody, well, and again, you, you guys, I, I believe maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but you guys are a little younger than me, right? So Robert probably knows when you're digging through textbooks and digging through I'm card only- catalogs and, you know, b- back in the day, we didn't have the internet, right? So it was like... I did the same thing though before the net, man. I was at my local library and I drove down, you know, I had somebody drive me down yeah. to the, uh, you know, big Milwaukee library where they, it's just a huge place and they had all kinds of books. I, I found books on, uh, you know, military uh, secret projects and other conspiracy stuff that claimed about advanced propulsion research. And honestly, I mean, there, for all I read and for all I found and as many things as I checked out and returned and the few that I didn't return, uh, they got lost. I yeah, I mean, there, there was just really not a lot of good engineerable information. And it left me as, as a youngster questioning both the validity of people's ability to report information accurately and the academic community for literally not addressing any of these claims. So I, I'm between this place where people make amazing claims, but don't tell you at all how to do it. And this place where people say all these amazing claims are totally impossible, but also tell you don't, they don't tell you how to disprove it. So here I am stuck somewhere in the middle and I'm like, the only way to find out honestly is to test it. Well, here, let me, I, I'm going to boot monomorphic cause I think that is Bill's. I'm pretty sure that's Bill's wife. So let me, let me boot her out. That way it doesn't run all night in there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, business and by business, I mean, uh, APEC. Uh, Robert, we're going to, we're planning on calling this meeting as get together APEC or Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference, or more of a, a discussion, but it, APEC has a, uh, has a has a nice ring to it. And then this way we could have a logo and, uh, you know, make it, make it a little bit more official and, you know, put out invitations that look a little bit more enticing than just a, uh, a Zoom link. How many people do you want on your conference calls? Do you want to keep it a small group or... You want uh, this is only our second one, and so far this has been the most we've had. So you've already seen the greatest number of people in here so far today. Uh, yeah, we, but, can, we can post it if you want, advertise it on our website and post it on LinkedIn because uh, we we did a web thing and we ended up with a few thousand people on it. Um, well, well I, for anything like that. Yeah, no, uh, so I, private engineering group. I, I guess my thought. Sorry. Go ahead, I'm sitting cross-legged in my chair. Me and Tim were having uh, conversations about this uh, on a side chat. Um, my there, fear is that there's a lot of kooks in this uh, industry, and we want we don't want flat earthers. Uh, we want people with engineerable ideas. So if you have a far-out wormhole idea, you know, keep it to the wormhole conference. 
Well, we'll listen to it if you tell us how to build it, but we just want yes, to yes, yes. Yeah, we'll if listen you, to anything that can be built. Yeah, so so okay. we're underscoring the word engineering. <laughs> this is um, alternative propulsion engineering conference. We're not interested in the theory unless it has an engineerable you know, solution. So we really need to weed out the people who have these crazy ideas that they love and that they're, you know, they put their ego yeah. to the idea and that it just throws everyone else off. So what I was thinking of doing is maybe having, you know, an open conversation as tryouts to the, uh, to the actual conference so we could weed out who's actually viable and who's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good idea because well, you know, I, what, what might help, I think what might help also is for, for the next, you know, maybe, maybe we could try and do one of these every week or something like that. Um, and maybe have, maybe just invite different folks. Um, you guys probably all know Paul Murad, right? Cause I've been promoting him on my site for years and, and then oh, Ron I here, wasn't he? I'll, I'll yeah, pa Paul was here, Paul was here. And then Ron Keita. And I'm glad well, Paul guy. was here because Paul was, he's been ill lately. So I'm glad he's still Paul and it. Ron were amazing. I mean, Ron is yeah. just a freaking encyclopedia. Yeah. You know, Ron, say you about, Ron say was old when I got into this. So, um, you know, but then John Hutchison, actually he tagged John Hutchison just texted me and he said that he had too many people around. It was going to be chaos. So he didn't want to join. And then, you know, there, there are lots of other folks too. And, and again, what I would do is let, let me put a post up on American Anti-Gravity and I can add some other, I, I can forward that to a couple of friends, you know, so. You yeah. see the power of this conference, hey, Tim? Yeah, well, you know, uh, to, to be honest, I, I mean, again, I, it, it's not that the technology is there, it's that um, everybody knows how to use Zoom now, right? Like I've been wanting to get these folks together for 20 years. And the problem is it's like, well, I don't know how to set this up. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. And, and it, it just became this nightmare. And now it's like, oh, wow, you can do group video conferences and the pandemic has forced everybody to learn Zoom. So now you can actually get people like Ron Keita on a video call, right? Yes, or like, that's a crazy idea, right? Yeah. And so, so I think, I, you know, I think that really is kind of historic because all of these, like with these old timers, the old timers all met each other at conferences. They used to go to conferences and meet each other, but not all at once, you know? And, and they never had their equipment with them. Like over here, you can go live from my lab. Uh, Jeremiah and yeah. both have their own lab and they're showing you actual experiments that they're working on. And one of the main problems in this field I find is that you might have some interesting idea about some experiment that was done a couple of years ago, why they did it wrong. It's irrelevant already. By the time you see that and, uh, you know, talk to the guy, he's already, you know, reused those parts. He's already thrown out the setup. So mm -hmm. your input becomes irrelevant. Right now, when we're showing you an actual experiment going on, input's very relevant. I actually had one of the, uh, uh, there was a lady that was watching the entire time and she says she's a, a waveguide expert and I'm definitely going to hook up with her. You, you know, yeah. And I, I have weird, but part of this is me. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm 44, but I feel kind of old <laughs> and, and, you know, I've interviewed when I counted, well, this is okay. Just the audio interviews on American Anti gravity, uh, 85 audio interviews. And, and then in terms of videos, conference interviews, probably another 60, 50, 60, something like that. And, and one of the things that I've been having, one of the reasons that I'm writing again, you know, just in general, is a, a lot of the older folks that I've been interviewing are, have been passing away. And in those interviews that I've done, um, I, I have a couple that were absolutely brilliant who, who just no longer with us. Ari de Geis, he passed. Um, I interviewed Robert Boussard. He passed. Now, that wasn't all gravity, right? They're different specializations. But I would say probably 10% or more of the folks that I've interviewed have passed. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm really thinking about now with this stuff is legacy, right? Because one of the things that the, the old timers always, their approach was like, take this, pass it on, you know? Because they don't want to, they don't want to, with those guys, they don't want to lose for a lot of them. That was their life's work. Or yeah, if it wasn't their life. what we want to do. We, we yeah, are here so. with open arms saying, please tell us 
how you did what you did so that we can do it too and validate you and also show the world that it's real. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, I think that's where things are going, you know? It really, so. it, it seems like it because I think the momentum is behind it and just the audience tonight, you know, a lot of people that you wouldn't expect on here again, Ron for, for fine example, Richard Ben Derek last time. I mean, Holy cow with that guy. Yeah. So what you wouldn't expect. And one of the, th so one of the things that I'd like to do, and this is one of the things I've noticed. Right. And so like, um, like, uh, you guys haven't met Robert O'Keefe before, right? And so this is, a, but the thing is what, what you all have is you all have an interest and you're all looking stuff up. And so you put it like Jeremy's YouTube channel, American Anti-Gravity, stuff like that. The advantage to that then is somebody can go in there and they'll build familiarity with it, even if they don't know you. And then it's not, you know, right? And, and so, and that's not just Mark, that's Mark, that's Robert, that's Paul, that's anybody. They start to build familiarity. And, and that's the standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Where everybody is learning and we're all kind of, we're all kind of helping bring each other up, I guess. You know? Exactly. We've got a new YouTube channel that we're, uh, that we're working on now. And yeah. uh, we haven't uploaded any videos to it yet, but it's going to basically be a, an amalgamation of experiments and open discussion about the experimental process of, of what we intend to do to try to verify many of these claims out there and give them some validity. Yeah, there you go. Well, and I'm, I'm working on AAG right now, actually. So that's one of my, that's one of my projects. I've got a lot of, a lot of cleanup work to do, but. And, and Jeremy Rye is on the same boat. He's, he's also rebuilding uh, alien scientist and he's been working on trying to create a new media outlet to, uh, to fix the old images the old image problems with, uh, with the associations and the names. So there's, there's a lot going on. I think we're all kind of rebranding and starting something new. I'm going from sort of join the technicians, which is a do it yourself, uh, high voltage and experimentation channel, which doesn't have a lot of videos really, but has a, a fairly high reception rate to uh, something brand new here. And that's really my passion where it sits. So I think the propulsion channel, I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to put some of this stuff up. I'd seriously considered taking American anti-gravity down earlier this year. You know, I, I mean, I did all that work, but then at the same time, I, well, in, in my case, I noticed a couple of things. Number one, um, like pretty much everything I had done has been liberated, right. In one way or another. And that's our community. You know, people take stuff and repost it. And so all, all the videos I've done have been moved to other channels and all of the, the stuff I've written has been moved to other, you know, and so, and that's not bad, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I had enough value to do that, but so part of it was that, but then the traffic was down also. So I'm like, well, so this, this gives it new purpose. I'd love to put up a few of these, you know? And so what I talked to Mark about was just maybe cutting these up. Right. You know, and uh, just cut right, them because in. each speaker sort of has their own very, very valuable piece of information. And then there's just, there's some discussion parsed throughout, but if it could be all put into a single block where, you know, questions asked to that particular participant are relevant to how other people can do it, it'll be really helpful. Yeah. And I'll, a lot I'll, of work and editing, but yeah, I mean, it's possible. I'll have to figure out what the best way to, we'll probably have to go night by night and maybe outline some of the speakers or something like that out and try yeah. to outline some of the topics. Yeah, just give like one speaker, you know, X amount of minutes or whatever to explain this thing. And then there's going to be another speaker after that. This way we can keep the topics separated. And yeah. And make the editing much easier and make it a more coherent conversation so that we're not just going off in different directions all the time. And yeah. as, you, as you get to know these people better, you'll get to know more what to ask too. Like Bill Alec, for instance. So Bill, Bill Alec, he, he's been more kind of into the free energy side of things, but he's an electronics engineer. That's been his career. And he's been building like sensors. He built an Accutron watch. He was trying to measure time anomalies and stuff like that. So, so um, I was talking an... about uh, writing. We actually hooked up with a, um, a, a writer who has a degree from Harvard. We took interest in the uh, Falcon Space uh, Project, and she's been writing a book about us. Um, I have it over here, one of the uh, early drafts. It's actually like seven or eight chapters in already. It's it's written as a um, a, no a nonfiction, a creative nonfiction, she calls it. And um, yeah, if we ever come across anything uh, revolutionary, there's going to be a book ready to be published that you know for the general masses to understand, you know, how this happened and how it came about and uh, bring more interest to the, uh, to the topic. Uh, 
what we're what we're working on ultimately uh, will revolutionize the world, and you know nobody should take that lightly. You re you all realize the implications of discovering real anti gravity, and uh, it's not to be understated. So it's something that should be taken seriously, and it cannot happen uh, privately. It cannot happen secretly. It needs to happen in the open, and uh, everyone needs to have access to it in order to create this bloom of uh, new technology and new uh, transportation methods. Yeah, the other thing go. is just safety in numbers. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, there's you said safety. there's safety in numbers. Oh, yes, there is safety in numbers. And, uh, Absolutely. We, we try to shout it as loud as I want. And I was joking the other night. Uh, Tim was telling me, uh, oh, be careful. Uh, China is going to come and hack you to try to get your information. And I said, all they have to do is sign up to my YouTube channel. <laughs> 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 yeah, freaking sign up to my YouTube channel. You'll get everything. The thing, the thing is, so getting a group of people to collaborate, it's like we're all specialised at what we do, but we can't all do what each other do. It's like what you're working on with uh, the microwave stuff. It's like I understand a bit, but I, I could never dream of being at that level of your understanding what you're working at. So each one of us it won't happen. You got to dream that you can do it and then you can do it. But it, it's like, you can only focus on so much. Like you can only, I'm not, I'm talking about the blinker approach. I'm on about, uh, each one of everybody that was on air tonight has their own speciality and their own understanding of what they're trying to do. So I think like by, like, with Tachyon Aerospace sharing some of what we've done with anti-gravity effects and uh, <clears throat> like I know what we've done has been validated as well. We've had it validated by third party government agencies that have looked at our technology and done reports. Oh, have you ever had it replicated? Yeah, we've, we've replicated a number have of you had machines. It independently replicated, I guess is what I'm asking. An independent lab replicate your experiment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've had a couple. Um, Robert, are you on uh, Ron Keita's email list? Probably. Um, uh, you, um, you'll, uh, you'll notice you'll notice lots of extra commas and periods. <laughs> then you know he's you're on his list. Yeah, because uh, one of the guys, uh, <laughs> I know one of them's really super opinionated and not afraid to speak his mind. I don't know whether that's wrong, but I know there's, uh, I was introduced to, I'd have to go back and look because it's like we speak to a lot of people in Tachyon, but I, I know one of the guys was talking to in the US, uh, he was a physicist working on anti-gravity and he was working on alternative forms of energy. So we were telling him what we'd done and shared some of the, the stuff we'd done. And he said, I need to put you on this list with all these guys that are working on it. So that's how I ended up on this list now. Because there's, yeah. there's, there's quite a lot of people on there. There's maybe 50 odd people, is it? I know uh, there's a lot. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few people on that list. I actually mixed a couple of lists together. Um, Estes Park this year, which is the, uh, you know, whatever propulsion uh, workshop was canceled in person. And instead they did a Zoom conference. And at that point I, I realized that, hey- Yeah, well, you did mix lists together. Let me, let me take a look here. Yeah, I did. There's like a hundred emails in there. A couple you of don't even know You don't even know who you emailed. That's the interesting thing. Let me see. I really don't. Uh, but I do know that uh, Lou Elizondo was on there. So anyways, um, I realized that the entire conference, you know, since it was on Zoom, all the conference is is a uh, email list at this point. So we just copy the email list and voila, send out a Zoom uh, notification and see who shows up. And uh, so far the conversations have been very lively and uh, we've learned a lot. There's a lot of stuff here that we can take back to the lab. Um, Anyone who is on the chat, who is on the uh, video call, uh, will get a copy of the uh, link. I'm going to post this video up to uh, YouTube unpublished, 
uh, later, and uh, we'll, we'll take a, um, a you know a vote amongst everyone that was actually here. If anyone doesn't want to show their face, we can cut those parts out. But uh, Tim, Tim, and uh, and others are very interested in uh, posting little little snippets of this uh, of this conference. Um, Robert, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm good. I don't mind. Okay, so we'll we'll, we'll then cut uh, cut your piece out and uh, and stick it on. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The, well, the, the, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably bail out, guys. I, it's just about time. Uh, Mark, do you want to give me a call? Give give me a call yeah. before you go to bed or something. So, okay, I, gentlemen, I I'm gonna bail out. Robert, it was wonderful being on the call with you. Um, we're we're gonna try and do this regularly. And I I what I will try and do is like again cut this up and put pieces up earlier pieces because Mark's looking pretty darn tired, but <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get you guys talking. Um, Cause I, I, I'm excited. It, it feels like, it feels like this is kind of, I, I maybe it sounds lame to say it, but it feels like this is historic for this community. It and is. If, if we're able to wrong. do a few more of these and get a few more people, it, it's it, it, what I'm excited about is the cross pollination. I mean, in a weird way, it's a small community, but it's a community that never comes together, right? And so it's all friend of a friend. And now it's the first around. time almost ever that we're really coming together in this way. It's exactly as powerful as you think it is. My yeah. mind has been thoroughly blown so many times from, from the sheer amazement of the names in the same space at the same time. And those discussions and the depth that they go, I mean, all I can say is humbling and mind-blowing. Yeah. So gentlemen, have a nice evening and, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out when the next one happens. Okay. Good night, everyone. Nice talking. Good night. Thanks.